Hello, welcome to The Naked Scientist with me, Chris Smith, and also with Hannah Critchlow. Hello, Hannah. Hello, and this week, the insects that have gears in their legs to help them jump straight. There's also the discovery that television soap operas are altering how people speak and electrifying your mind. We're going to be delving into the workings of the brain to find out why chilli is hot, mints taste cold and how light can be used to control nerve cells. And with that in mind, we've got a question for you. We'd like you to try and estimate how many megabytes of memory, and you can use other units as well if you want, a human brain has. And as always, we'd love you to join in with the discussion, so if you would like to put any questions to us this week or next week, you can send them in now. You can tweet at Naked Scientists or email chris at thenakedscientists.com. First, let's take a look at what's been making the science headlines this week. Chris, what have you got for us? Well, there's a really interesting paper that's come out this week, Hannah, which is something of a landmark, actually, in the world of stem cells. Scientists in Spain have managed to produce in situ stem cells. Previously, when we wanted to make stem cells by reprogramming a specialised adult cell to become what we call an undifferentiated or unspecialised stem cell, also known as an IPS, or induced pluripotent stem cell, you had to take the tissue, put it into a dish, and then add various chemical factors to it, which would wipe the genetic slate clean in that cell. Effectively, they would reset the cell and turn it back into a stem cell state. But this week in the journal Nature is an interesting paper by Manuel Serrano, who's a researcher at the Spanish National Cancer Research Centre. And what he and his colleagues have done is to make genetically modified mice where they have added to the mice these same four factors or at least the genes for them so every cell in the bodies of these mice carry these four factors except they're under the control of a genetic switch so they can add a dose of an antibiotic called doxycycline and it turns on temporarily the expression of these factors potentially reprogramming any cells that see that drug and when they give the antibiotic to a group of adult mice, they see very shortly afterwards growths coming up in many adult tissues. And these growths are called teratomas, which are a hallmark of the presence of these so-called primitive stem cells, these induced pluripotent stem cells. And they then go a step further and they took blood samples from these mice and found that there were stem cells circulating in these mice, which if they then put those into a very early developing embryo of another mouse could turn into every tissue in that mouse, including, and this has never been achieved before, parts of the placenta and what's called the trophoblast, the cells that surround a developing embryo. And this suggests that these newly reprogrammed cells that develop in situ in the body are much better at being stem cells in some way than cells that have been made via previous techniques. And the spin-off of this, why this is important, is it shows you can reprogram adult tissues in situ in the body. So you could, if you had a disease in a certain organ, you could direct some cells in that diseased organ to turn themselves back into stem cells, and those stem cells could then be controlled chemically to turn into the right sorts of cells to rebuild or repair the damaged organ. So there's something about developing these stem cells in the actual body, in the mouse body, that then creates a a better stem cell that can be used to create anything else, any other cell. in, in Yes, and they don't know exactly why that happens. They speculate in the paper in Nature that this could be that the three-dimensional environment of the body where these cells are being born is a much better culture vessel, if you like. Perhaps there are other signals there or the, or the environment is much more conducive to these cells reprogramming. It's a, it's a more delicate environment. It's pretty harsh when you put cells in the dish and treat them this way. And it might be just that doing it in the body gives rise to the full potential of these cells. But very exciting and a landmark paper. But there's some way to go because obviously at this stage they're just making stem cells. The next step is to be able to make the right stem cells in the right place and make them turn into the right sorts of cells that do something useful. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Um, So I've got a story that's uh, really pricked up my interest recently. So it's published in the journal eLife and it's by one of the authors, Alon Chen, who's at the Weizmann University in Israel. Now, so traditionally, when you're looking at how um, rodents, how mice interact with each other, you might employ a few PhD students or early stage postdocs to spend hours and hours and hours looking at videotapes of little pairs of mice uh, working together and score whether the mice are, for example, um, sniffing each other or maybe they're grooming each other. 
So it can take hundreds of hours in order to analyse how mice are interacting and behaving in different scenarios. But now Alan Chen and colleagues have developed a new clever methodology that combines behavioural neuroscience, so looking at social interaction in these mice, and also using clever mathematical um, models to generate thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of videotape and um, and using clever dyes, so disco, disco light, so ultraviolet light that are pink and yellow and green. They're labelling these mice differently, groups of four or six, four to six mice with different disco paints and then collecting data via a UV microscope and then using really clever algorithms that can then analyse all of that light data in order to compute how these mice are interacting with each other, whether they're sniffing each other and, and, and whether they're grooming each other or whether they're just avoiding each other. So put simply then, you paint some dye onto a mouse, mm -hmm. you shine ultraviolet light onto it and that makes that mouse glow up with a specific colour mm -hmm. and a camera is watching where the mice go and, and so a computer can painstakingly log all of the movements of the mice and who talks to who over time so you can build up a sort of social picture of what the mice are doing. Well, why is that useful though? Well, um, if you want to look at certain disorders, say, for example, autism or schizophrenia or even anxiety disorder or depression, there's a lot of social interaction elements that are implicated in those disorders. And we can use mice to model some aspects of those disorders. So we now have a way of generating vast amounts of data on these different aspects of schizophrenia or, for example, autism, um, using this, this mice model and this new technology using disco lights. So it's kind of highly reproducible. So you could give the mice a treatment or give the mice some kind of environment that's different across different groups and then see how that treatment affects your, your mouse model of whatever condition you want to study. Exactly. And so Alon Chen has received um, hundreds and hundreds of requests to use this system, this new technology, since he published it this month. Um, so he's sending out um, the programming for, for this technology to hundreds of scientists across the world so that they can use different models for schizophrenia and autism, different genetic models that they've got, um, and start getting lots of data and start understanding the systems a bit more. Makes sense, doesn't it? If you can write a computer program to do something, why use a human when they could go and do something perhaps even a bit more constructive? Now, zookeepers in Edinburgh have said this week that they're uncertain whether a giant panda in the city's zoo might be about to give birth to a cub. So why is it so notoriously difficult to get pandas to breed in captivity? And how can there be so much doubt over whether one is actually pregnant or not? Well, to find out, here's Dominic Ford and Kate Lamble with this week's Quickfire Science. Giant pandas are native to only a small mountainous region in central China. There are thought to be no more than 3,000 of the animals remaining in the wild and 300 living in captivity. Bamboo makes up 99% of a panda's diet, but its nutritional value is so poor that each animal has to eat between 30 and 60 kilograms every day. That bamboo also contains so much fibre that a panda may need to defecate up to 40 times a day. To compound the problem, pandas have a digestive system similar to that of other bears, adapted for eating meat rather than a vegetarian diet. Their poor diet means that mother pandas have little energy to spare on raising cubs, and their babies are tiny and almost completely helpless at birth. Even after a year, panda cubs have typically grown to only a third of their full adult weight. In the womb, panda fetuses are unusual in that they do not implant until several weeks into the pregnancy, making it difficult to tell whether a female is pregnant. Normally, a spike in the hormone progesterone a few weeks before birth tells vets that a female is expecting. But while Tian Tian, the panda at Edinburgh Zoo, had such a spike last month, her hormones have since shown contradictory signs. Breeding captive pandas is especially difficult, as males usually fight over females in the wild, and this seems to be essential in building up the male's libido. Moreover, female pandas only ovulate once every 12 months. This means that there's only a 36-hour window every year in which she can become pregnant. Pandas have become endangered because of habitat loss in China due to more intensive farming. Even though there are now extensive conservation efforts, their slow rate of breeding means populations grow incredibly slowly.
thanks to Dominic Ford and Kate Lamble. And you can grab Quickfire Science as its own podcast from our website at nakedscientists.com slash quickfire science. Panda goes into a bar and says, uh, I'll have a I'll have a beer. And the barman says, Why the big pause? Warning time now. TV programmes can seriously affect your accent, at least. That's the conclusion of a study that's been published by Glasgow researcher Jane Stewart-Smith, who's found that speech characteristics from characters in the popular BBC soap opera EastEnders are being picked up by Glaswegian youngsters. We'd done some research to look at Glaswegian at the end of the 20th century, and to our surprise, because Glasgow was a very long way away from the southeast, it's about 450 miles away, some of our informants, particularly inner city kids, were using features that we would associate more with the southeast of England and much less with Scotland. Well, when you say using features, mm. can you just explain what you mean by that? Yes. We're looking specifically at features of pronunciation. So we're looking at when you say f for th and in the following clip, what you'll hear is the word tooth spoken by two people. The older man says tooth and the younger man says tooth with a f. Tooth. Tooth. It's quite subtle and you might not automatically have got it because actually f and th are very easily confusable. So just have one more listen. Tooth. Tooth. In the younger boy, you can hear how he definitely has a Glaswegian u, but he's also got this f at the end. The other feature that we found which is spreading involves the L sound, things like people and shelf, and that is really quite unusual. So here are another two speakers, an older man who's saying shelf, and he's got an L sound, and the younger adolescent doesn't have it. Shelf. Shelf. Just have another listen. Shelf. Shelf. Can you hear the shelf? OK, that... it's very blatant, actually. Once you highlight it to me... The older person, who presumably speaks pure Glaswegian, untainted by whatever we think the uh, influence is, mm -hmm. is very different to the younger person who has this new way of saying it. Absolutely. They have very different accents. Probably, you know, everybody listening to this programme, if you were to hear those speakers just talking, you would still get the impression that they were both very Scottish and very Glaswegian. So what's happening is that very specific aspects of the accent are changing, but the rest is staying very similar. How did you actually do this research? Well, we actually went and recorded people. We worked with some local schools. We thought that people would talk more naturally to each other if they were allowed to choose who, who they could talk to. They would find a friend and then they would sit and chat to each other. And then we got them to read a, a word list. And we also got lots of information about their life and their social life. So we wanted to find out about the kinds of different factors that might affect their speech. So obviously, if you've got somebody saying things like shelf and tooth, you might immediately think that it's got to do with the people that they know. Because we know that in language change, what affects us most is who we talk to on a daily basis. That's how language changes. So you're quizzing them about who your friends are, who you interact with, but also what you do with your life, presumably. Exactly. So what we were looking at was everything from how many, you know, how many family members lived in their house and, and where their relatives lived and how often they saw their friends to how often they went out and the kinds of things they did. And also, amongst all of that, we asked them lots and lots of questions about all aspects of their media, the kinds of music they listen to, radio, films, videos... So what do you think is causing this? Well, now we've done the actual study and we've looked at it statistically, what we found, there are several things together. One of them was to do with social practices. The more that our kids adhered to sort of local Glasgow street style, then the more they were going to use these features. We also found a weak relationship with having relatives and, and friends and family and communicating with them who are outside Glasgow and specifically in the south of England. And then this other factor was um, this effect of television. And specifically, we'd looked at a number of programmes, but the programme that, that emerged as a significant factor in the analysis was EastEnders. And it wasn't just watching EastEnders. It's not just having it on. You know, your mum might be watching it, your auntie might be watching it. It's not that. It's actually really engaging with EastEnders. When you say engaging, so that would be, for example, if I particularly identified with a character or a particular storyline had resonance with me and a personal experience. So I almost identified and wanted to mirror the individual that was having that experience in the programme that's when, what, this emulation of the way they speak on EastEnders comes through. 
Yes, well, I certainly agree with you about the um, really being involved in the characters and sort of being in, involved in the stories. So I think there must be at some level some kind of, of social identification. But I have to step back a bit about um, whether there's genuinely emulation or imitation of speech because... From what we can see, it's definitely not imitation in any sense of being consciously aware or being able to imitate overtly. We actually looked at imitation as a possible model and the kids couldn't imitate EastEnders characters. So they didn't all go around saying, can I have a word? Which is what seems to be the buzzword in EastEnders quite frequently. Exactly. They're not picking up catchphrases um, and they're not not trying to imitate EastEnders at all or indeed they're not really trying to imitate any kind of media. This is one of the reasons that actually it's taken us a bit of a while to think about, so what is the mechanism? How is it actually working? Traditionally, linguists have always said the media doesn't have an influence on language change. And there's good reasons for that, because, you know, when people watch TV, on the whole, they get up after their, you know, evening of, evening of viewing and they don't end up speaking with different accents. But I, I will refute the fact to mm. a certain point, which is that my children are not very old, mm. but they've been immersed in a lot of cartoons mm. with American voiceovers mm-hmm. and I hear them playing with American accents. Exactly. And we see we do see a lot of kids using specific voices for specific characters when they're playing. And this is what they do. But I don't think there's any good evidence yet that the features are actually kind of leaking out into their normal pronunciation. So can you put all this together for us into a sort of nutshell? What exactly is the bottom line of what you found? Kids in Glasgow with not that much contact with Southern English speakers are using more of these London-based features and that's significantly associated with strong psychological and emotional engagement with EastEnders. Jane Stewart-Smith from Glasgow University. She published that work this week in the journal Language. So if you keep listening to The Naked Scientist, you might end up sounding a bit like a scientist, who knows? Actually, we did get an email, Hannah, from somebody a little while ago and he said he downloaded our entire podcast catalogue, nakedscientist.com slash podcast, more than 500 hours of programmes. He said he listened to the lot, in some cases several hours of programmes per day, and he said to me in this email, I knew I'd overdone it when I even began to dream with an English accent, so I think it does rub off. (laughs) That's fabulous. And also very committed of him. So now to some more news that's caught my eye this week. Something that I've often wondered, I don't know about yourself, Chris, but could a bloke's ball size predict how good they could be in terms of their paternal skills? Um, We're talking testicular size, right? We are talking testicular size, yes. So there's been a um, a paper that's been published this week which seems to suggest that men with smaller testicles tend to be more involved as fathers. It's not yet known, however, if ball size could be used to preemptively predict paternal skills. So this has been published in a really high-ranking journal called Penis. It's rather an aptly um, named journal, which is the acronym for the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences. And it's by James Riling and colleagues at the Emory University in Georgia, America. So they measured the volume of 55 fathers' testicles using MRI scans. And they then asked um, the the fathers um, how well they thought they were at parenting. So they asked them questions like, for example... Do you help bathe your children when you come in from work? Would you like to help bathe your children? How how well would you rate yourself as a father? Um, Do you help pick up the children from school, for example? Do you spend time reading them stories at bedtime? Um, And not just content with getting the father's reports on how how they were were as a father, they also asked the mother as well. Um, And they also put the father under a brain scanner and they looked at brain activity as the father was shown pictures of his children. What the researchers saw, possibly kind of counterintuitively, those fathers with smaller testicular volumes actually seem to be better at parenting in terms of these subjective questions of whether they they helped read um, the children bedtime stories and what the mothers thought of their parenting skills and um, and also the areas of the brain that lit up with higher amounts of activity in the empathy areas and the, and the consideration for other areas of the brain when they looked at photographs of their children. I gather though from what you're saying that they have just looked at one moment in time this is not a longitudinal study following people up so I guess they don't know if those people who were very good parents with now very small testes if actually before they had children they had much bigger testicles because we know that men's behavior changes when they have children we know that they become much actually much more paternalistic they're much less aggressive after having children 
That's that's a really good point, Chris. And I, in fact, I've got some friends whose uh, whose wives and partners have had just had children, and their entire body shapes have changed. Actually, they may have got kind of love handles, and and there may be I don't know. There's something going on where they're where they're You're just eating too much. They're, <laughs> they're going through the maybe the pregnancy process with the woman. I don't know. I don't know what's happening, but their body sh- um, shapes are changing. And so whether there's any any changes down there, it's not it's not yet known. So we can't use this study to say that you could preemptively predict. Um, the paternal skills of a man based on his uh, testicular volume. We can't say I'm that. I'm sure someone will give it a go. Anyway, thank you for that, Hannah. Uh, also this week, uh, scientists have discovered that insects may actually have their very own built-in gearbox. This is Malcolm Burroughs, who's a zoologist at Cambridge University, has a paper this week with Gregory Sutton in the journal Science. And they have been taking extremely fast footage of insects leaping, and they look at a species of insect, the plant hoppers. The fancy name for these, in Latin, Issus coleoptritus. These are the champion jumpers of the insect world. If they were human, they would jump over a block of flats. I mean, these animals can literally leap more than a metre. They're tiny, and they can take off at speeds of maybe 20 kilometres an hour, which, when you're smaller than a flea, is no mean feat. How do they do it? Well, they launch themselves using a pair of extremely powerful rear legs. But the important consideration here is if you're putting that much power into a leap, unless you get the two legs directly in sync and one leg is able to, say, take off slightly before another, you would whiz off to the side, wouldn't you? Because there would be an asymmetry in the force that was applied to your body. So by taking their fast footage, they realise that the two legs are launching the insects and they're synchronised in space and time by less than 20 microseconds, 20 millionths of a second. So how is that happening? They then zoomed in on the back legs and they see that there is this system of gear teeth on each leg less than about a third of a millimetre long, is this rack of 12 gear teeth. And as the insect draws its legs back and together to prime itself for a leap, these teeth engage and then ratchet round against each other. Then, as the insect sends a signal from its nervous system down to the motor nerves that control the muscles to say, fire now, it doesn't matter if they're a little bit out of sync because these cogs have to literally unwind against each other which constrains the movement makes it synchronous and off it goes and they think it's probably the first time that an an animal has been found in nature that actually employs a gearbox like this that's fascinating, absolutely fascinating. So it's almost like the insects are creating their own pogo stick using kind of their legs having Velcro so they stick together to create one, just one leg and they poing off using this pogo stick. Thank you, Chris. And as always, you can find more information, including the references for all the papers that we've discussed on our website, which is at thenakedscientists.com forward slash news. Thanks, Hannah. And you're listening to The Naked Scientists with me, Chris Smith, and with Hannah Critchlow. If you'd like to get in touch with the programme, don't forget we're running a little mini quiz. We'd like you to tell us in megabytes or gigabytes or terabytes, whatever your preference is, what do you think the memory capacity of the human brain is? You can email chris at thenakedscientist.com or you can tweet at Naked Scientist. And on to our main topic for the week now, and to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Cambridge researchers Alan Hodgkin and Andrew Huxley receiving the Nobel Prize for explaining the electrical nature of how nerve cells work. Cambridge is this week hosting a special neuroscience conference, and top scientists have travelled in from around the world for the event. Now, the people who are here with us are David Julius who is from the University of California at San Francisco. He looks at how nerve cells signal pain. We also have Fran Ashcroft. She's from Oxford University, and she looks at the electrical activity in cells. And also she has an interest in diabetes and how electrical activity in cells of the pancreas are relevant to the release of insulin into the bloodstream. And we also have with us Carl Dyseroff. He's from Stanford University, and he works on a technique where we can turn nerve cells on and off using light and as well as that amazing array of guests, we also have Dervla Glynn, who is the conference organiser. So, Dervla, I believe that Alan Hodgkin and Huxley, they used a particular species in order to understand the electrical properties of the nervous system, and they used squid. Why? It was a pretty simple reason, really. What they were studying was the axon, or the actual nerve, and the simple reason why they used squid was because of its size. 
So an axon, or the nerve that they were using in squid, it can be measured up to one millimetre, and they're generally about 0.5 millimetres, which is quite big when you consider that a human's is about a thousand times less than that. So for the practical reason, they could actually insert electrodes into these axons and measure the electric potential. Obviously, they were quite plentiful in the Atlantic, and also they were able to manipulate the cytoplasm or the salt content, so the sodium and potassium, and that's how they were able to measure measure the voltage in there. So they got these squid from, I'm presuming, not the River Cam? No. Well, in fact, actually, they started their experiments in Cambridge in 1935. And in 1939, they released a short paper in Nature just before the outbreak of war. They both went and then worked in the war. And they didn't get back together until 1945. And so they worked in Cambridge, but they also did a lot of their work at the Marine Biological Association Laboratory in Plymouth. And that's actually where they got know, all the, the trawlers came in yeah. and they got their squid there. And so they put this wire down the squid's nervous system and then measured that there was electricity that was flowing down this nervous system. Correct. And that's how they found yeah. out that how our nervous system, in order to control our thought and also in order to allow us to move, uses electricity. Electricity, just well, like what did people think before that then? Before we knew that the squid actually were electrically conducting, do we know what the sort of prevailing wisdom was? Well, this oh. is uh, Carl Dyseroth. Uh, you heard my introduction already, but people knew that electricity was involved for a long time before that. People knew that you could stimulate with electrical shocks and get muscle movement. The genius of Hodgkin and Huxley was to figure out exactly how the communication happens, what the currency of information flow in neurons actually was. And it was this beautiful event called an action potential, which is generated by sodium channels and potassium channels that work together in a beautiful pattern. And only by working with the squid could they do this. And so it was the sodium and the potassium, because they're charged ions, and they carry charge and they carry current. And that's how they worked out that we can control our thought and use thought and movement in the nervous system. So, Dervla, you've got this conference that's coming up in the next two days. What's this conference about? So this conference really is about two things. It's celebrating Hodgkin and Huxley, but it's also really about their legacy. And all of the speakers that we have are, they're doing work that is related to ion channels. And that's really the big significance of Hodgkin and Huxley's work. So there will be people talking about ion channels in respect to all different types of diseases. And so it's really relating the work that they won a Nobel Prize for 50 years ago and how it's actually come forward and how all these important findings, because it's, it's pretty much one of the most important findings in neuroscience, but how it's really translated in today. So there'll be people talking about pain, stroke, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's disease, and also then also about the basic biology of these ion channels as well. Thank you, Devla Glynn from Cambridge Neuroscience. Perhaps we should just explain what an ion channel is. Because the important thing about ion channels are that they conduct ions. They allow ions like sodium and potassium, common salts, to go through them. But they're nothing more than tiny little pores that sit in the membrane that surrounds every one of your cells, not just the nerve and muscle cells, but all cells in the body. And the most important thing about them is that they can open and close. And when they're open, the ions can go through, and when when they're closed, they can't. And because the ions flow from a high concentration to a low concentration they also carry an electric current and that's what is responsible for generating the electrical impulses so it's almost like these ion channels are a door that can be opened and closed that allow charge to go in and out and that allows electricity to flow i think the important thing to remember is that in living systems electricity is carried by ions the currents are carried by ions whereas in the wires that run through your house, they're carried by electrons. So there's some, somewhat of a difference. Thank you very much to Fran. More from her in just a second. Let's turn to David Julius, who is from the University of California at San Francisco. David, you're very interested in how the nervous system signals pain. And looking at your resume, this pot of bright red chilies I have in front of me is something which has featured very much in your work over the years. How does the nervous system signal pain? And if I eat one of these, why does it make me feel I've got a pain in my mouth? Well, you know, the nervous system signals pain the way that Fran's already described, that there are ion channels and other molecules that are activated by different stimuli, you know, be it a hot chili pepper, which we'll talk about in a second, or temperature or pressure. And that induces the opening and closing of ion channels to change the flow of ions across the membrane. When that happens and you activate the cell, excite the nerve fibers, say a sensory nerve fiber in your lips when you eat a hot chili pepper, 
that sends an action potential or message to the brain that you eventually perceive as a noxious or painful stimulus. So the reason that chili peppers are painful, and sometimes people think of this as a taste response, a gustatory response, but it's really a pain response. And you would know that if rather than eating the chili pepper, you chopped one up and then stuck your finger in your eye, and that would obviously be a pain response and not a taste response. And there's a pungent ingredient in chili peppers of the capsicum family called capsaicin. And the plant has, you know, over evolutionary time developed this compound to fit very nicely into a uh, pocket of an ion channel called the vanilloid receptor, a trip V1, which is, you know, pretty highly expressed, particularly on nerve fibers that are involved in sensing painful stimuli. As it turns out, mostly specified for detecting heat and inflammatory agents. And when capsaicin binds to this channel, it opens up in the way that Fran described. It's like a little donut that opens up and ions flow through the membrane, and this activates the nerve fiber, and then you perceive this as a pain response. So in my nervous system, I've got lots of different sensory nerve fibers, which are supplying my skin and my eyes and my mouth. Do different nerve fibers detect different sorts of stimuli? So we're talking about chilies here, and if I eat these, I get a stinging, painful sensation, but I also would describe it as hot. If I suck on a polo mint, I get a sensation of coolness. Or if I put my hand in ice, I feel cold. So are they different nerve cells that are doing those Um, senses? They are, to a large extent, different nerve cells. So this is, for many years, was a big debate in the pain area as to whether nerve fibers that detect noxious or, you know, pain-producing stimuli, of course, these are stimuli that have a capacity to cause tissue damage. That's why we perceive them as being painful. There is a debate as to whether they're all, you know, the same functionally or whether there are distinct subsets. And now we know really through molecular studies that not all pain-sensing nerve fibers are the same, that they're specifically tuned to detect different things. And so the subset of nerve fibers that detect cold are to a large extent distinct from those that detect heat. And you can tell that because the molecules that are involved in detecting, say, capsaicin from a hot chili pepper or menthol from a mint leaf are the same molecules that are involved in detecting heat versus cold. And if you look at where those genes are expressed, they're expressed in largely non-overlapping subsets of nerve fibers. So that's kind of like in what we would say a labeled line to some extent, that you have these different circuits coming in from the periphery that inform you about different sorts of percepts. I mean, just ignoring the effects of chili for a second. So when I'm feeling heat or sensing cold, how are my nerve cells detecting those stimuli? What's going on in the nerve cell to enable it to tell what the temperature is? Well, pretty much the same way as that we just described for these chemical mimics, if you want to say that, for these compounds, these chemicals that elicit these sensations. They're acting on some of the same molecules that are involved that are actually activated by heat versus cold. And so they do the same things. They're activating an ion channel that allows ions to flow into the cell. So when you touch a stove or if you eat a chili pepper or put a mint in your mouth, it's basically the same thing. And really what these compounds from these different plants do is to act on the same ion channels that are involved in sensing heat or cold. And what they're really doing is they're acting as what we would call allosteric modulators of the channel, which basically means that when menthol from a mint comes in contact with these channels, they change the temperature at which the channel now must respond to be active. So it sort of fools the channel into thinking it's cooler than it is, so it it, it discharges. It enables it to be activated at a higher temperature than it normally would be activated at. And that might be, for example, the temperature of the nerve fiber in your mouth. And so now the nerve fiber thinks that it has interacted with a cold substance, but instead it's just being sort of fooled in a sense. In some ways, similar to the things we'll hear about from Carl in terms of how light can mimic the actions of different things. And if I'm unlucky enough to be bitten by a snake or a tarantula or something, and this elicits pain, Mm -hmm. are the venom molecules in these animals also effectively binding to these same targets, such as the chili pepper does, in order to elicit this sensation of pain? Yeah, there are some. So, you know, venoms, as you may know, are very complex mixtures of all kinds of toxins. But we found, in fact, that there are some toxins in, say, tarantula venoms that target the same channel that capsaicin targets from the chili pepper. So it's a really beautiful, I think, example of convergent evolution. Here you have these two organisms. One's a plant and one's an animal, namely the chili pepper and the spider. And they have both evolved chemical defense mechanisms that activate your pain-sensing nerve fibers basically to say, stay away from me. But they do so by very different chemical strategies because the molecule in the chili pepper is a small organic molecule 
the toxin in the spider that activates the same channel is a large, well, it's a peptide or a small protein. And so they've converged on the same mechanism, but they do it through a somewhat different chemical armamentarium. Now, if I eat a lot of chilies, and Hannah picked me up on this on Friday because she fed me some chilies she had in the or office, and she said I wouldn't eat those, but I did. Yeah. And I thought they were refreshingly spicy, but not over the top. Hannah said she thought they were really hot. I eat a lot of chilli, though. So yeah. if I keep on eating the chilli, does this have any kind of damaging effect on my sensory nerves? Yeah, probably um, reversible. But, you so know, people eat, who eat a lot of chilli <laughs> really peppers, sure. probably if you're a kid growing up in Korea eating a lot of kimchi for breakfast, you'd be have a much higher threshold. But what's actually chilies. happening? Are you damaging nerve cells or are you just um, losing the receptor? The well, you're probably channel? doing both. So you're probably what we call desensitizing the receptor, the channel, which means it sort of goes into a quiescent state. But if you put capsaicin at very high concentrations on, say, an area of your skin, your forearm, whatever, you will cause those nerve fibers to sort of wither and retract from that area. So there is some damage. Fortunately, peripheral nerve fibers will grow back and re innervate those areas. But there is a decrease in their presence or their activity there. And in fact, this is sort of underlies a paradoxical use of capsaicin as an analgesic. Because if you get these bombs with capsaicin and rub it on, it will either desensitize the nerve fiber or cause it to actually regress from that area. And as a result, you've sort of denervated in a sense functionally or physically de denervated that region. Uh, yes, I think it, I've seen people use that for pain caused by shingles, for example, right. haven't they? That's right. And it can be used in very high concentrations, for example, for things like that or what we call neuropathic pain associated with viral infection, things like that. David, thank you very much. David Julius from the University of California, San Francisco. And we've actually had a question in from one of our listeners, Dennis Chakhaza, who got in touch via Facebook, and he asks, why does a toothache so much? What's going on there? Because, I mean, toothache is so painful. So what's happening there? Can yeah, you... I think a toothache's one of those great examples of how when you're in pain, you know, it's so salient, you don't pay attention to anything else. And you can't do anything else except think about getting rid of the pain. I think your toothache is painful in part because that region of your body, those molar beds are very heavily innervated by what we call nociceptors, a subset of nerve fibers that are involved in sensing pain. So there's just a lot of very dense innervation of the nerve fiber. And then, you know, a lot, there's a lot of inflammation that occurs sometimes when you have a bacterial infection or some other form of tooth decay. And that adds to the problem by enhancing sensitivity mm -hmm. to nerve fibers. So maybe he needs to um, get some antibacterial treatment and also maybe listen to some music or read a story in order to... And, and see a dentist as well. Now, moving on to our next guest. We've heard how nature has informed our understanding of pain pathways and perception, but how exactly are these signals transmitted? We've touched on it a little bit already with Professor Fran Ashcroft and we're joined again with her now. So, Fran, you're the Professor of Physiology at Oxford University and you're also the author of several popular science books, including most recently The Spark of Life, which answers questions such as why does an electric eel not shock itself so iron channels i believe that you've got one particular iron channel which is historically one of your favorites ah well my favorite iron channel is of course the one that i personally work on but i think the one that you're referring to is one of my favorite stories and this is an iron channel which is involved in the sodium channel which is involved in the conduction of nerve impulses and as we've already heard, all sorts of chemicals can interact with iron channels. And there is one which is known as gryanotoxin, which is found in the pollen of a certain species of rhododendron, which is found on the Black Sea. And its effects are best described, perhaps, by Xenophon in 400 BC, when he explains how his soldiers ate of the honey that was made from the pollen of these rhododendrons and found themselves with lots of diarrhoea and purging and vomiting and having convulsions. And, and he has this marvellous phrase that they all lay on the ground in a state of great dejection. Oh, gosh. And fortunately, they recovered and nothing really much happened for another 200 years until Pompey was invading that area. And the Greeks remembered this story of Xenophon's and they collected the honey and strewed it in the path of the oncoming troops, who ate it, so the became troops, incapacitated. So the troops took a little break, ate the honey that had been there as a honey trap. And were incapacitated mm. and were then decapitated. Uh, so this was perhaps one of the earliest forms of chemical warfare and... I shouldn't say this, but at the same time, it's another example of the fact that one should not trust Greeks bearing gifts. <laughs> <laughs> and 
What was this toxin actually doing to the iron channel? What then? the toxin does is it holds the sodium channels open. We've heard already about toxins which act by blocking iron channel function. This one acts by enhancing the activity of this particular iron channel. And it had this wide-ranging number of effects on the digestive system and then of the eventual decapitation of the soldiers. Uh, there's another coda to this story, really, mm -hmm. and that is that these days, of course, the rhododendrons are still there. The honey is still produced by the local bees. The honey's blended with many other honeys, so the toxin is diluted out. But in that local area, you can actually get the, the honey that is made specifically from this particular species of rhododendron. And it has a local vogue as an aphrodisiac. Oh, wow. Uh, which is rather unfortunate. And there are even stories today, you can read them, very recent papers in the scientific journals of men who have taken some of this and ended up in hospital rather acutely ill. That's an interesting story. And you mentioned that you work on a similar type of iron channel now. It's slightly different. Mm -hmm. The iron channel that I'm very interested in is one that's found in the cells of the pancreas. And this channel is involved in the regulation of insulin secretion. So as most people know, insulin is the hormone that controls your blood sugar level. And if you don't have enough, you get diabetes. And I've been very interested in trying to understand what is the cause of diabetes. And what we found was that when this iron channel is open, insulin is not released. And when the iron channel is closed, insulin is released. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but the insulin is not going through the channel. The closing of the channel just triggers a whole series of events. And what's been particularly exciting for me is that a colleague of mine recently found that mutations in this particular gene cause diabetes at birth. And we've been able then to take that forward and show how this happens. And what's been really extraordinary is that children with this disease were always treated by insulin injections. But when we recognised that they had a problem with their iron channels, we knew of a drug which shut the open channels. And so we were able to transfer the patients from insulin injections onto drug therapy. And of course, that's transformed their lives. It's made their blood sugar control very much better and it's also they prefer not having injections as you can imagine it's yeah. difficult to inject a three-month-old baby yeah. I should just mention that this is a very rare disease so it's very unlikely that most people who've got diabetes when they were young it's, it's only found in patients who have diabetes before the age of six months thank you Fran this is the Naked Scientist with me Chris Smith and with Hannah Critchlow Carl Dyseroff is based at Stanford University in California and in 2005 he came up with a new technique called optogenetics. And this is a way of controlling nerve cells using light. Carl, how does it work? Well, optogenetics works by using light to open ion channels. We've heard a lot about ion channels and how they can be controlled by the electrodes that Hodgkin and Huxley used. Of course, those could only be put into a, a squid axon. And if you want to study the mammalian brain, where things are a thousand times smaller, uh, you've got problems with putting enough electrodes in. We've also heard about chemicals that can affect ion channels, can open them and close them. And those are great. Those can get all the way through the brain, but they don't have this millisecond precision that is the normal currency of information flow in the brain. So what if you could have both? What if you could have high speed and allow access to many different neurons at once, even in, let's say, the mammalian brain? So what we do is we found that there are some uh, microorganisms that make just the perfect tool for this. They do it for their own reasons, not to help us out, but it turns out to be the perfect thing. There are small algae, small kinds of bacteria as well, that make light-activated ion channels, and they use this to sense what's going on in their environment, to respond to it appropriately, to generate energy for a whole range of different functions. So these are marine microorganisms That's which right. just happen to make a chemical structure which is sensitive to light. They use it for one job, to regulate their behaviour, but you're saying you can steal that and use it for your purposes. We did. We capitalized on the millions of years of evolution that went into designing these beautiful proteins. And we bring them into mammalian neurons, and we can turn mammalian neurons, which normally don't care about light very much, 
turn them into very sensitive, precise, light-responding uh, units. So you take, what, the gene from the alga, which would normally make that channel that the alga uses, and you can put that gene into the nerve cell, making the nerve cell respond to light in the same way the algae would. That's right. And it sounds a little far-fetched. In fact, a lot of people thought that it would be very unlikely that genes from these algae or these ancient forms of bacteria would work well in mammalian cells, that they would get to the right place in the cell, that they would have the right supporting components that would help them uh, function well. And to some extent, they needed some help. We had to engineer the tools a bit to help them work well. In the end, though, it works quite well now. And we can now flash on pulses of light of different colors. We can turn on and off different kinds of cells, even while animals are freely behaving. So you put the gene from the alga into the nerve cell, and it's in some way color selective, so you can use different colors to control different subsets of cells. That's right. Some uh, algae make proteins that respond to blue light. Some archaebacteria make proteins that respond to amber light. And in fact, there's a whole spectrum of these that uh, are made by nature and that we can tune somewhat also with some uh, protein engineering. And we can put one kind of protein into one kind of cell, another kind of protein into another kind of cell, and even start to act like the conductors of the orchestra, if you will, and, and have different elements, different instruments play at different times or at the same time. How do you put the genes into the brain cells that you want them to go into in the animal that you want to study? Yes, well, this was the hardest thing. After the initial proof of principle that these tools could work well in cells, then the question became, well, how are you actually going to make it useful? How are you going to target these into the cells of interest? And this took a few years to sort out. It was helped by the fact that these are all-in-one proteins, that there's just a single gene that makes a single protein that does all the jobs. It gets the photons from light, and it delivers the ion flow. So we only had to put one thing in. And we use a range of genetic tricks, actually. We can use uh, little bits of DNA that are called promoters or enhancers, and different cells that do different jobs will turn on or off these little bits of DNA that govern the expression or the production of proteins in cells. If we attach these little bits of DNA, the promoters or enhancers, to the gene for the light response of protein, and then we put that into all the cells in the region, it'll only get turned on in some, and that gives us a very powerful kind of specificity. There are other kinds too. For example, we can use the very remarkable shape and morphology of neurons if we put the gene into one region of the brain, but we deliver light into another region of the brain that may be far away, we can selectively, therefore, stimulate the cells that live in one region but send a connection to the other region where we're delivering the light. And that turns out to be very powerful. We call that projection targeting, and that you don't actually need to know any genetics at all. You just need to know your anatomy. How do you get the light that's going to do those jobs into the right bit of the nervous system in your animal? Yes, that was another thing we had to sort out. In fact, a lot of skepticism early on, people said, well, light doesn't penetrate very deeply into the brain, and that's true. It'll only go about a millimeter in before it's 99% scattered and absorbed. But we uh, developed fiber optic methods for targeting very deep brain structures, and so now we can play in patterns of activity into very deep structures in the middle of the brain and the brain stem, even while animals are behaving. And just very briefly, what can you do with this that we couldn't do before? Well, now we can play in precise patterns of activity into defined cells, and I'll give you just you know one example. I'm interested in motivation and uh, reward, what makes people want to do things, what makes them feel good about doing things. This is something that is impaired in depression and various kinds of psychiatric disease. And we're now playing in different patterns of activity into a kind of cell called the dopamine neuron, and we're determining that some patterns of activity but not others turn out to control feelings of reward or motivation. And that may help us understand these psychiatric diseases. Carl Dyseroth from Stanford. Thank you very much, Carl. Amazing work. Now, just before we go to our question of the week this week, just time to tell you the answer to our quiz. We asked you at the beginning what you thought the capacity in either megabytes, gigabytes or even terabytes of the human brain might be. Now, this is pretty contentious, and there's no one clear answer for this. But we could take one simple approach, which is to say that the human brain contains of the order of about 100 
billion nerve cells, so 10 to the 11 cells. Now, if we assume that 10% of them have something to do with memory, we divide that 10 to the 11 by 10, that's 10 to the 10 cells. If we assume that they make about 10,000 connections to other cells, and each connection can be regarded, therefore, as some sort of information, then that means that there are 10 to the 14 connections in the brain, and therefore 10 to the 14 bits of information. There are 8 bits in a byte, so if we divide 10 to the 14 by 8, that's 1.25 times 10 to the 13. So that means that, according to our definition of memory, of being the storage of purely bits of information, the human brain has a storage capacity of something like between 10 and 100 terabytes. So basically, not as much as Google. Now let's find out what the answer is to an perhaps even trickier question, Hannah's had her nose to the ground for this one. This week, we sniff out the answer to this. Hi, my name's Adam from Melbourne, Australia, and my question is this. How come in pregnancy, the sense of smell seems to be heightened? What's the reason for this, and what's the science behind it? So, is it true that sense of smell increases during pregnancy? We churn over the data with Professor Paul Breslin from the Monell Chemical Senses Centre in Philadelphia. It's quite common for pregnant women to report that odours are stronger for them, that they're more sensitive to odours, that they're somewhat less tolerant of ambient room odours, and that odours tend to be more unpleasant. Laboratory studies have shown that pregnant women rate above-threshold odorants, those that are weak to moderately strong, as more intense than do non-pregnant women. There is little evidence, however, that pregnant women are more sensitive to odors in the absolute detection sense. That is, they are not able to detect the presence of odors at lower concentrations. So it appears that the wide report that sense of smell heightens during pregnancy is not due to increased smell sensitivity, but actually due to above-threshold smells appearing stronger and making them appear more disgusting. But why does this happen? Over to Tim Jacob, Professor of the Psychophysiology of Smell at Cardiff University. This particularly happens in the the first trimester of pregnancy and it's thought that there is some evolutionary advantage here in that it's necessary for the mother to be very careful what she ingests, not to ingest toxins and other poisons, both for her own health and for that of her fetus. So what could be controlling this sense of smell during pregnancy? Back to Paul. We have found that female hormones can greatly increase sensitivity to odors in women who are attending to them compared to females who are too young to cycle or compared to postmenopausal women. So it appears that female hormones can influence the function of the olfactory system. Thanks, Paul, and also to Adam, who got in touch with the question. And finally, thanks to Tim, who also points out that there are cases of expectant mothers with a decreased sense of smell. So it's not a hard and fast rule for all. Now switching our senses over to safety. Kalind wrote in with this. Is there a safe way to consume nicotine? Is smoking tobacco a lot worse for your health than snuff? So what are the relative harms of nicotine containing products? Are patches dangerous compared to e-cigarettes? Is snuff a safe alternative to smoking? Thank you to Hannah Critchlow. And if you have any clues as to the answer to those, you can email chris at thenakedscientist.com. You can also tweet at Naked Scientists or write them on our forum, nakedscientist.com slash forum. That is it for this week. Thank you to our guests, Dove Leglin, Fran Ashcroft, David Julius and Carl Dyseroth, and to Hannah for joining me. The production this week was by Kate Lamble. Next week, we're looking at citizen science, big science experiments done with the help of you people at home. Have you taken part in one of these projects or are you trying to get one started? We'd love to hear from you. Chris at thenakedscientist.com and give us your experiences. Thank you very much for listening. The Naked Scientist comes to you from Cambridge University. It's supported by the Wellcome Trust and the EPSRC. My name's Chris Smith and until next time, goodbye.